all those teams, this guy, and I got all those teams. Like I got all my teams. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> hey, we played with the league, though. We played with the league, right? That's why everybody we're friends with everybody in a sense. We got the grand tour. That's it. <laughs> we got the grand tour. Everybody else pigeonholed to one team. We got the entire tour. And, and so we had the whole big league experience. And, and all the luggage. <laughs> oh yeah, I got tons of luggage. Yeah, you know I still get luggage now. Like I'm on, I'm headed back to spring training towards the end just so I can get my luggage and my cold gear shit. <laughs> Yeah, not only that swag you're getting, you're getting from your your godson now, dude. Man, we got to talk about all this. You've had some oh, yeah. eventful things like life after baseball. I never thought it'd be busier, busy as it is, right? You're right. I'm with you. It's like I thought you were retired. I'm like, yeah, but I am retired because what we did for so long was that was work. Yes, that was work. It was intense, was, right? Never you say, it yeah, intense. intense. It never stopped. It never stops. It, it feels good to breathe, but um, I don't know. I wanted to ask you how you feel. I mean, you played, God, two decades like me in professional baseball. And uh, it just, it, it, now that it's like you get out of the out of the site, you're lucky that you're still wanted and in it because they push a lot of us out because there's not enough room. It's okay, but it's, it's hard it's transitioning. And it's exciting at the same time because you got all this time now to do, hey, I want to learn how to play guitar or I want to do a podcast or I want to go travel, right? So tell them what you're doing uh, besides all the the stuff we see on your Instagram. <laughs> well, Grilly, I'm, you know what? I made sure when I was playing um, that I developed a lot of relationships. I did a lot of networking while I was playing. And <clears throat> I think, excuse me, I think the beauty of playing for 11 different teams, you meet a whole lot of different people. And and I'm not just talking about the people in your clubhouse. I'm talking about the grounds crew. I'm talking about yeah. the security. I'm talking about the ushers that's, that stand outside the section where our family is doing the games. I mean, just a host of people. And I, I took that and tried to use it to my advantage um, because I knew at some point after year maybe 10 or 11 for me, I knew I was a lifer in the game. I knew I was going to be a lifer. And the only way I was going to be a lifer after the game, if I continue to do what I was doing, making relationships with players and people around the you know organization and people in the, you know, around the city, other places where I played, always thought it was important to give back to the community that, you know, came out to support every team that I ever played on. Um, but just, you know, just being present, being where your feet are. I think that's a lot of time. A lot of times been as a player, you know, we get so caught up in our everyday routine of trying to compete and, you know, got this team coming to town. I got to be ready to do this, but just, you know, not looking too far ahead, just trying to be where my feet was. And, you know, I always wanted to be in baseball and I had the opportunity um, when I retired in 2015. I had opportunity to do tune in um, radio at home. And they set up this home office like it is now, this makeshift. But my other house, I had a nice office and all that good stuff. And I was doing like a NFL blitz, but we were doing that for baseball. And that was fun. Did that probably about 80 games um, in 2016. And I would, you know, get on, start about 6 o'clock in the afternoon, be done by 10 o'clock at night. Um, it was fun. And then the next year's. I uh, give everybody a, a little credit, like the GMs and all that. They didn't start calling for me to come to uh, be a special assistant until after I was at home for a year. So they understood, like, there was no reason to be calling after I just spent 25 years in the game <laughs> and thinking I'm going to I'm gonna come and work after, you know, right after I just, you know, hung the cleats up. But had a lot of offers from different teams early on, and most of the teams were teams I didn't play with, Grill. Like, None of the teams I played with came at me right away. And I, um, the Rangers, I live here in North Dallas in Frisco. And, you know, I was going over to the Rangers games, um, you know, talking with John Daniels, the Rangers GM at the time. His assistant was Thad, who's our uh, GM in Minnesota. And just helping out over there, you know, just getting a feel for the organization because it kind of looked like that's where I was going to be working for um, and, you know, didn't know that Thad was interviewing for the GM job in Minnesota and Thad got the job in Minnesota and he called me and was like, Hey, let's go to lunch. And, 
he offered me the job to come to Minnesota with him. And I thought that was pretty, pretty cool because John Daniels had a chance to sign me. And he told me that, Hey, I didn't want to push too hard at the end because I knew Thad had opportunity to get that job in Minnesota. And I knew he probably, you probably want to go back to your alma mater and work there. And I thought that was pretty, uh, pretty special of him to take that in consideration. So had the Mariners, had a few other teams I didn't play with come with me. But it's just, you know, I think I did my I think I did myself real justice by um again being present in the moment, you know, networking with people around me, um, making sure that and I think one of these things really we I think a lot of players take for granted, like not having your name attached to bullshit. Mm-hmm. And always having a good rapport with your managers, your gym, GMs, and your teammates. Yep. And that rapport comes with being a leader on and off the field, um, being a guy that, you know, being able to squeak out another one or two years because of your character. Yep. And we don't think about character being, you know, a huge component when you're in the game because you're making so much money. You think you're on top of the world. You know, you just, you're, the, you're the man when you're making all that money. But there's going to come a time when you're not making that money and then people have to see you for you and who you really are. And at the end of the day, I'll always say it. I don't care what the back of my my baseball card says. I care about what my teammates and the people that were, that were around me say. Well, you know, yep. I got to say, too, three, you covered a lot of things that I wanted to touch upon. One, your name, image, and likeness, which is a big hot topic besides AI today. And keeping your name in the good graces of that because – Look, at, I, I think your home roots, like you said, who was your favorite, that, that one team that you felt like this was my team, even though you played for all these different organizations. Sounds like the Twinkies, the Twins, were your, were your squad. And uh, I know you got your own podcast. And uh, with Jock Jones, another guy I faced a lot, gave me a hard time in the AL Central. You guys were the shit. And, uh, you know, at the time, you were always winning. And... Um, you know, keeping what you said to that point of keeping your name good in the game. And I think as the older you got and more distinguished, more respected yourself, uh, you know, when I say Latroy Hawkins, that's why I love having you on the show. We haven't talked, seen each other in a long time. We bumped into each other at the Colorado uh, All-Star game, right? All-Star. Yep. yep. A few years back. And it was just like, that's what you've missed the most is like you said, the teammates, the camaraderie in the clubhouse, and this is how we're jamming now, right? We're all in a, a spaced out, but it's still a tight fraternity, and we're all just got to help each other out, collaborate a little bit. Um, so it's good to good to see what you're doing, man, and good to have you on a mound visit because you own that mound just like me for quite a bit. Of time. I love that name, man. The mound visit, I love it. I love it. <laughs> I had plenty of those, and you did too. <laughs> Yeah. And sometimes it wasn't about what pitch, like, where are we going after you strike this dude out? <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? I remember Nephi Perez came up to me one time, and he was a player. He's my shortstop in Chicago, and I'll never forget the famous words. I think, I think the count was like 3 1. I had a man on first and second, two outs, and he came up. Hey, Poppy. Hey, Poppy. What's up, Poppy? What's up? And like, it's 3 1. <laughs> You know, one run lead, you know, and I'm in a bad count, definitely a hitter's count. Hey, puppy, hey, do me a favor. He said, you see this? Show me his gold glove on his Rawlings. You see this? You throw one pitch, let him hit it to me, game over. (laughs) I'm like, yeah. I'm like, okay. Yeah. I swear, next pitch, ground ball, it wasn't to him, but game was over. (laughs) He ran off the field. He gave me high fives. He was like, hey, I told you, one pitch, game over. I'm like, whew. See, that's but confidence. just that little confidence. Yep. Yep. That little bit of confidence. Yep. Yep. A little bit of confidence. You brought up something really interesting, LaTroy, that I wanted to touch on. And that is that you're able to – part of the reason you were able to stay in the game as long as you were, not only, you know, with how you performed on the field, but the your character and the way that you conducted yourself in the clubhouse. How does somebody go about, I guess, developing – that sort of trust and leadership and respect in a clubhouse. I mean, obviously being there, being in the big leagues for 21 seasons, that, that plays a part in it, but what else goes into making sure that you are respected when you're in a major league clubhouse? I think the, the number one thing that goes into respect in a clubhouse is giving respect. 
I don't care where you're from, what you did before you got there, how you were raised, whether you're black, white, Latino, Asian, I don't care. I don't care where you were raised. I don't care if you was raised at the top of the, of the food chain or at the bottom of the food chain. When we're in that clubhouse, we're all the same. Mm-hmm. We are the same. And just understanding, like, we have so much more in common than we have not in common. Way more in common. And I think that, I think the leaders are the ones who their teammates know that they don't care about anything else but how you treat each other, how you treat people outside the clubhouse, and winning. Everybody think winning is like number one. Well, there's a whole recipe that needs to be, you know, added to the ingredients to to get the outcome of winning and just having respect, like giving respect and having conversation and, and having conversation with the guys who don't speak your language, making an effort, making an effort. And a lot of times you don't, sometimes you don't see that and you have to remind people like, Hey, I'm pretty sure whatever your issue is, it's not that big. If you guys have a conversation, it's not that big because at the end of the day, our, all our, you know, what we're there to accomplish is pretty much the same. Some people take a different route to get there and they have to be reminded like, hey, just because Grilly was born in New, in New York and I'm born in Indiana, that means nothing. We have way more in common than not. At the end of the day, it doesn't have anything to do with your skin color, nothing. We have way more in common because guess what? We all got the passion for baseball. We all got passion for baseball. And if we start having a conversation from baseball, like we used to in the clubhouse, really out the games back in the day. Oh, right. And then those conversations morph into something else. It morphs into something else. But we're sitting, we're talking, we're engaging each other. We're, we're, we're talking about our differences. We're talking about everything that we are alike. It's so much that we can talk about. And then you get a better understanding with that other individual. We'll be right back to this week's episode of Mount Visit. But before we do that... We want to let you know that another stop has been added to the Stadium Series Tour. The Top 100 Experience is coming to Buffalo, New York for a two-day showcase event. This stop on the tour is an exclusive recruiting event for the 15 to 17U age groups only. The Top 100 Experience is a high-powered, multi-day event in a professional setting that helps you showcase your skills and talents at AAA ballparks. This is your chance to play at a professional stadium, learn from former MLB players, and compete in front of college coaches. Check out the other two stops on the tour as well, PNC Field in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and NBT Bank Stadium in Syracuse, New York. All three of these events have limited space available, so make sure you sign up now. For more information, visit the Top 100 Sports website and click on the Top 100 Experience page, or click the link in the description of this video. Now let's get back to the episode. But you know what? That's it's it's made me say that because I was in an all black wedding, and I probably a lot of people would be like, "That's so uncomfortable, right?" My one of my best buddies got married. He had me, and they were like, "Yo, you're one of us, man." I go, "Dude, I've been around." But to your point, I've been around it where the cultures and the religions, and we just had Cervelli say the same thing. You know, we got to figure out each other as people. And it makes it yes. make us great politicians, I think, because if we collaborate, we can do a hell of a lot more than if we're divided. And, yes, uh, That's, this I is get, true. I get chills That's talking true. about it because it, it, when when you see the guys pouring the champagne and celebrating, it doesn't matter what the MLB sport is. It could be football. Your, your Chiefs, they won. We we get. Don't sorry, Kate. He's a sorry. Buffalo Bill. <laughs> <laughs> but. Everybody says, "What was the what was the soup?" It's good chemistry. We believed in each other. We're pulling for each other, and it doesn't matter how long you've been there or how long you haven't been there. Uh, and the culture, like I said, being vulnerable in an alpha ego centric clubhouse, Ooh, right? Good call. That's the tough part. That's the difference maker. Because if there's a lot of individuals who want to be, hey, this is my team. I'm the guy. I want to be this. Well, great. You're going to find out it's a lonely place. Hey, if you got to say it, it's probably not. <laughs> <laughs> right. If you got to say it, it's probably not. Right. Nope. Right. Nope. So, uh, yeah, it's it's tough, man, because like you said, the cultures and what we were brought up on, the brand of baseball, we sound like old men now, right? The guys say, <laughs> oh, I used to walk up the hill in my snowshoes and this and that. And we talk about Yeah, hey, but man. we only sound old when we knock 
it, we only sound old if we're knocking this generation. Right. And I try not to knock this Correct. generation because that's when we sound old. Correct. So we're not just knocking this, this. We're not knocking this generation, so we don't sound old. <laughs> no. Not well, at you all. bring up you it, bring it, up it, a good point though when you talk about it, because this this gen. Sorry to cut you off, Grilly, but the this generation and this brand of baseball is so different and Grilly and I talk about this all the time it's so different from when you guys were were playing in the game and I wonder too when you talk about you know uh roles as special assist uh, special assistants and going out to spring training and helping guys out you know since the game has changed so much have you kind of had to adjust or has there been any sort of adjustment on your part going out there and helping players and you know have you kind of had to I guess, continue to learn and study the game in this later chapter of your yeah. career. Not get frustrated, right? right? Some of the things, it's not our game. It's not our way, right. not what we right. brand, what we were taught. So, yeah, speak to that, man, please. So, I never, like, just being in it, and I tell a lot of the older guys, everything changes. Everything changes. Whether you like it or not, it's going to change. The, the generation before us, the game changed, whether it was the money part or, you know, the way we went about our business. And now the way they play the game is completely different. Adapt or die. And the, and what I think older guys don't understand, if you played in the major leagues, you made adjustments and adapted. And you adapted every single game, every series, every pitch, every pitching change, every pinch. You were always adapting. So what's so hard about adapting now? I get it because we're not playing. So we're like, oh, why well, we need to adapt? Well, if you're going to enjoy the game and the way the game is played now, do I like all of it? Heavens no. I didn't like all of it when I was playing. I didn't like all the unwritten rules. Mm -hmm. It's part of it. But I like to see the game. I love to see the way the game is now because I think Major League Baseball is doing a great job of trying to um, cater to the younger generation. The generation is probably going to be a lot around a lot longer than myself and Grilly. They're trying to get our kids and then our grandkids to keep this thing going. But being able to understand Rap Soto, Track Man, that's part of my job. That's part of me evolving as a evolving as a special assistant. You know, so when I'm in a room, I'm not totally lost. I understand what they're saying, and then I can actually you know, quantify how I did it, how Grilly did it, you know, what made Grilly sinker so nasty. Hey, you know what? <laughs> he didn't have arm side run like I did. He had real sink, you know, and that real sink, his vertical break was, was like 17 inches. Like that's what made him good. So I kind of like quantify now what I know, what made us. Thanks for blowing me up. What made us. See, the older we get, What's though. That? the better we were. So thank you. You made me feel like, damn, I did that. <laughs> LaTroy Hawkins hey. telling me that I had a nasty sinker. Really? <laughs> it's, 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 this, what they have now shows us what made us good. Uh-huh. Right. We knew you had a great sinker. Yeah. We knew you had a good sinker and a good slider. But guess what? Now we can tell you why it was so good. And then tell other kids how to make an adjustment to make it as good or if not better. Right. And you can get that same pitch design. Yep. So I get it. I understand it. I, some of the stuff I like, some of the stuff I don't, but I have to be able to do that to continue to be, to play a major part in our organization's success. And I tell people like for my job, it's not, it's not making an impact at the big league level. We got a whole damn, we got 50 professors that travel with the team to make the team better. Right. <laughs> my job and I've had to learn this over time, making adjustments. My job is getting that guy when we first draft him, building that relationship from rookie ball or A ball, high A ball, double A, triple A. So when he gets to the big league, he and I already have this relationship. We've already talked a few 50 times, you know, throughout his minor league career. And what I do now, I'm not helping with break, breaking balls and fastballs and all that stuff. My biggest impact to the organization is from here to here, above the shoulders, because I can give them that that piece that Rap Soto and the coach that's trying to teach them that can't give him that real life experience. The book of done did it, not the book of 
oh, Rap Soto or uh, analytics. I can give you the perspective of this is how I felt. This is what this is the breathing technique that I use. This is the moment when I became uncomfortable and I became comfortable in uncomfortable situations. So, you know, my job is completely different than than the way other people see it. Well, that, there's something interesting about that, and, and it's slightly off topic, but it's in the same sort of realm now, and it's been brought up a lot. You talk about, you know, for someone like myself who didn't obviously didn't play professional baseball, I think of that that profession as you know as a dream, and it's it's you know it's just it's incredible. You get to play the game you love for a living, but it's been brought up a lot lately. And I think, you know, to point to Anthony Rendon's comments that were made, um, a couple of weeks ago when he kind of talked about, you know, you know, this is for lack of a, he said, this is a job and, and it's, you know, whether he's, it's his most favorite thing in the world, that's all different. But I think something else that was interesting is Merrill Kelly was on another podcast pitcher with the diamondbacks. And he said, you know, I think if you asked a lot of players, they would say similar sort of things. And I wanted to ask the two of you who were obviously in professional baseball for 20 years, at what point, or do you agree, I guess, with the sentiment that, you know, at a certain point, yes, it's fun. And yes, you're getting to play a a kid's game for a living, but it is a job. Where does it kind where does that shift? And how do you deal with that um, to go through your career and still know that, you know, you do get to play this awesome game for a living, but at a certain point, you're like, you know, this is how I make a living. This is my job. Run me through that as someone, as two people who have been in the game for as long as you have. Well, my answer may be different than his, in a sense. You go first then, big fella. Okay. The only time it felt like a job to me was when I was here trying to keep mine. Because I needed to figure out how to get some shit done to keep it. <laughs> Two, if I was out of the game because I was on a surgery table coming back from rehab and the game's going on without me, you still how significant, how much your job means to you. Because I don't care if you're a baseball player or if you're a high executive in some you know Fortune 500 company. People will say, I can't wait till I retire. Well, when you retire, you, you feel that transition is not what you think. And I think that's what every athlete really feels hard because this game goes on without you. That company's going to go on without you. Those people still got to do their job to make their living. And and I uh, say the third, lastly, I'll say losing. When you lose a lot, it feels like a job. It is a grind to grab that doorknob and go into that clubhouse knowing that you've only won five games in April and go, we got five <laughs> more months. And I don't know where we're going with this because when you're winning – it feels amazing when you're winning. It doesn't feel like a job. Everybody wants to win, right, Latroy? I don't know. Ed. Yeah, I, think, I mean everything you pointed out, spot on. But Rook Rondon, I've seen guys like him before, man. And it all starts. It all starts once they get hurt. They get hurt, and you're away from the game for so long, and you're at home, and you're. You're, you're rehabbing and you're not seeing much progress and, you know, you get to the point where you're ready to get back and then you get back and you're not back a month and a half. You don't have a hundred at bats in and you get hurt again. And, you know, that starts to play with your psyche. So when Rondon talks about like, what's first, what's the most important, right. it's the truth, man. Th- th- those things that he said are most important. It's just not a lot of athletes will go out and say right. that. And, and it's definitely not athletes that's that's been playing on a regular. You know, he's been out for a couple of years. So his thought process, he's so close to retirement mentally because he's been hurt. Nobody ever understand how close to retirement his thought process is right. His right. thought process is right now. And people only care about his statement because he's making so much right. money. Mm-hmm. They only care about it. But at the end of the day, like, that's how he feels. Like, we won't. I don't mind somebody being dr- transparent. I don't I don't I don't mind that. Um if he was on my team, um, if he was on my team, I probably know him well enough that those comments wouldn't have surprised me. I was going to say, I mean, what, what's his the reaction team? in the clubhouse to something like that? It depends on what type of leaders right. you have in the clubhouse. Like, I mean, everybody sees him on that team every day. If he's with the team, they see him grinding, trying to get back. They see his frustration. They see he's, 
you know, he's probably starting to, you know, push away from the team because he just don't feel like he's part of the team because he's been hurt so much. And man, when you start thinking about retirement at the at the age he is, it's time to start talking to somebody because you know what? Those those type of thoughts, man, can consume you. And then when you get on podcasts, you say stuff like that. And and that's his truth. But that's probably just his truth in the mind space where he is right now. That mind space of being hurt, it sucks. Mm-hmm. It sucks. Everything starts to creep in when you're looking and watching your team play on TV. And then most people, well, Papa bond has been a big, a big, very big and outspoken about, about Rendon. And I'm just like, Pap, I know you played with the guy, but. I mean, well, here, I hate blasting. I hate blasting our our fraternity. Thank man. you. I, I was just really gonna say. I, just, I remember you defending, and I was so happy when I heard you say it. Yeah. About, this guy should be making this money. Well, wait, man. You had to make the money you made. So why are you mad at him? If that's where yes. if you played in that era, you'd be making close or somewhat, or have the ability, the chance. I'm not I mad at people for making more money than when we played. That's look at what, what do you think my dad it was supposed to happen? Right there, you said go back to the change. What my dad made twenty seven grand as a big leaguer back in nineteen late seventies. Okay, those players had to work in their off season, in all season. and train, which they don't train like they train now. Right, and then they're going back to if they get back to the clubhouse, it's like oh, it felt like a vacation. They enjoyed it, you know. They loved it. those guys. My dad, I guarantee you, they love the game even more than the players now because of the added. I feel. Only because the way they speak of it. When I sit around the Steve Blasters here in Pittsburgh or the Bill Mazeroskis, mm-hmm. right? You've sat around with Kirby Puckett, I'm sure, and yep. all these legends, right, in your clubhouse, the, the 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 teams that you play with that you looked up to, and you sit around, you didn't say anything, you just listened and absorbed. And their stories of how they loved, respected it. And when I first got drafted, Willie Mays was sitting there, and I just was sitting there going like. Oh my God, man! I'm sitting listening to Willie Mays talk right now. Like, it 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 it, it was amazing because they loved and respected it. But as to you says, like, I don't get mad. And these guys, I think the bitterness of not being able to do it anymore. It is a hurt to our ego that we were once superheroes that got to wear these awesome super costumes <laughs> and we got to do all these crazy every day. things every day that the superpower every day. power palette of adrenaline got to. Let us do something crazy. And I hated if I gave up a bad game and it's all over the TVs or social media now. It's hard, man. Right? So it's also yeah, right that mental side I think is harder for people. And that's why I say maybe the the mental side as it's shifted, you talk about change. I feel like that's been more of a component for guys that have to work on that daily because of the scrutiny and the things like, oh, he's making money and he said this. And, you know, we love to see in society the 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 rags to riches story, but don't get too successful because, like, right? You're yeah, they come hey, everybody's hating they come the Kansas you. City Chiefs. Why? Because they're so good. Why do you hate success? Nobody, Everybody hated Tom Brady because he was so successful. <laughs> Right. Misery loves company, bro. Yeah. Misery loves company. And <laughs> the, and the, go back to the older guys. If you don't leave the game better than you found it, I think your generation failed. Yep. So your dad's generation, they fought. Yep. They had work stoppages. Yep. They fought for what they believed in. And you know why they did that? It made it better. It helped them a little bit. Yep. It helped them a little bit. It helped us. Yep. It helped us. Your dad and them sacrifice helped us. Yep. Our sacrifice helping the generation now. So that's why I think it's important to know your history. I ain't talking about American history. You need to know that too. But I'm talking about no Major League Baseball's history. No collective bargaining. You need to know who some of the guys are that 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 stood up in those collective bargain agreements and who fought. You need to know those guys like Dave Winfield who lost checks. Yep. That's who lost a lot of money pension. to make sure. My dad doesn't get a pension. There's all these guys. There's about 800 guys still that don't get a pension even, which I think is a crime. And I'm close to it because my dad's one of them. They got locked out. They went on strike. They made it better. But we 
aren't taking care of these people. I think that's a whole subject in itself. But yeah, that need to be addressed too. I, I've brought it up that so many times, and it's it, they put they put a little sweep under the table. It's like it's not a big issue. I go, listen, man, if these guys can go out and get health care and some of these things, I don't know. My arm feels great still. It's the rest of my body. That feels like- <laughs> I'm just saying that the other day. I can throw all day long, but my back and my neck and my hip and my ankle. Yeah. That shit hurt. Yeah. And we're sitting, it was sitting's the new smoking, and we're doing all these podcasts. And, and yeah, oh, my, my, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Straight elbow, no Tommy John. That's injury. incredible. But everything else hurt like a son bitch. Yeah. <laughs> everything, yeah. Everything hurt. Yeah. We have to leave the game better than we found. It. And I think our generation, we left the game great for this generation. That's why they're, they're able to make the type of money. And just remember, like, I always tell people if the money's not there, their team's not giving it if it's not there. The money's there, and they only give you – I mean, they're not giving you more than they can make off of you. That, no, that's not how it works. So if I'm able to pay you $500 million, how much money do you think I'm going to make off of you, Grilly? <laughs> At least $1.5 billion. Yeah. Well, I'm going to make my money off of you. So when you go, oh, he's getting paid too much. Whoa, 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 whoa. Stop it. Yeah. Don't ever say that. Don't ever say no. that. No. The Dodgers have no. definitely showcased that point. Oh, yeah. Clearly. Oh, that yeah. they find a way and they're putting themselves in the best position that uh, they are out to win. There's some organizations, like I said, I'm in the city here. I hate to say it because I beat it into a horse. I'm like, this organization is a storied organization, um, but it's becoming a feeder team for all these other big top tier teams. And I feel like Major League Baseball needs to do something about that business side of it. Because if you're not willing to give you that that player's five hundred million or keep the Andrew McCutcheons put mm-hmm. uh, for longer periods and keep the, the the first round picks that you are getting here and not trade them to the Yankees or the Dodgers, yep. then pay these guys because yep. they do have the money too, you know. And uh, I think they have to fix that because I'd like to see competitive balance or at least if there's no ceiling, at least make a floor, you know. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough to have a floor without a ceiling, but it's it is. Uh, yeah, right. It's tough to have a floor without a ceiling, You're right? Because you're always going to be swimming in space and get to one or the other. Oh, well, it's 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 an interesting question to ask the two of you as well, and and I'd be curious to see what you think because the game, you know, we talk about the game changing so much, and not only just with the rules on the field and and you know the way that you know technology and analytics have worked their way into the game, but baseball. You know, for all the talk about it being a dying sport or whatever, it's making more money than it ever has. So, you know, when when we talk about, you know, needing to grow the game, I, I think we need to ask the the players, the fans, the people who are really consuming the game that we all love. And I'd love to ask the two of you because it's a it's a popular topic. And I know a couple of years ago there was the, uh, you know, let the kids play that entire um, sort of thing. And, and, you know, it didn't seem like major league baseball took its own advice and stuck to its, that marketing campaign. And it seems like, you know, now there's the whole thing with, and it's something as silly as a uniform. I know, but it's like when the main topic of discussion at Major League Baseball spring training is that the players look goofy in their uniforms, I think we're just doing a disservice to to what the game to to growing the game. And I'd love to know what you guys think about that. Yeah, they because, were making some see through pants, weren't they? Some well, from, yeah, I, I heard mean, it, it, was little, the... <laughs> it was a little too too revealing, I think. But definitely, the uniforms are different. I had on mine last yeah. week, and I'm like, oh, okay, there is a okay. difference, but. Uh, Nike and the Fanatics says there's no difference. Well, right. Like, and that's not true. Um, I think them saying there's no difference is like the NFL having all these people around the table who never caught a pass. So that's why the NFL don't know what a, a catch is. They don't know what a catch is because they refuse to have Jerry Rice or, you know, some of the great wide receivers on the board to let them know what a catch is. But with the, I don't want to, I don't get it, man. The, the the letters on the uniforms are smaller. Seriously, and it's and it's something. It's very small. Right. It's very small, but it's the world of the media, man. They're gonna pick mm-hmm. apart everything. So it's always gonna be a topic until Nike gets it right. I do know this: when Majestic was still making the uniforms for Nike, they were perfect. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they were perfect, and I'm not sure if. 
Nike went and bought or paid or whatever they needed to do to get their engineers or those people who make work for Majestic, because that's usually what big companies right. do. Somebody can do it better. You go buy the people that can do it better and bring them on your side. But the uniforms are they're not good right now. Yeah, it's a conversation. I think it's a good conversation to be having because baseball is not a lot of not a lot of headlines right, right. now. You know, a Wheeler just signed this morning. Right. Um, you still got four free agents out there. Well, three, three Two free agents pitchers. that all bore signed. Montgomery, yeah. Snell, and who else? Montgomery, Snell. Well, Chapman just signed. Chapman's off the board. Uh, Chapman's off the board. Yep. Bellinger's off the board. It might just be. It might just be Montgomery those two guys Snell's right now. There could be a few others, but I know uh, Bellinger and Montgomery yeah. were the ones that we were waiting on. So, uh, but e- either way, it's like you got the reigning Cy Young Award winner still not signed. You got a guy who just won a World Series who's still not signed. It's it, it's all interesting. And now the main topic of discussion is that the players look goofy in their uniforms. And I know that this is just from a fan's <laughs> perspective. I think about when we talk about growing the game. To go back to that for a second. Um, Something as simple as I know it's, you know, to the outsider's perspective or maybe someone who's not a a big baseball fan might look at that and be like, ah, whatever, it's just the uniforms who really cares. But when you're trying to grow the game, I almost think that the easiest way to do that is step one is make sure that the players look cool in their uniforms. And it seems like (laughs) it could be part of it. You know, I I don't know. I think with the younger generation, I think they don't care about the uniform. They care about what's on our well, feet. Well, that's good. That's a good point. Point. I said our feet, yeah. really. They said our, I said our feet. No, they care what's on their feet. Yeah. And I think that's a that's the cool thing that MLB has kind of like, you know, dialed yeah, yeah, back yeah. on custom cleats. What stuff the players like that. on yeah. their feet, custom yep. cleats and that's stuff. The, I don't know. It's almost like that's the contract that's almost like the most is my shoe deal. The shoe deal, not having yeah. a shoe deal, right? All the shoes you got to pick. I missed that deal. <laughs> <laughs> I missed the shoe deal. Missed I, used to deal. Get, I used to give shoes to my, my, my mailman because we had such a huge contract. You get new shoes and boots yeah. and shower shoes and sandals, and it didn't matter. No matter who you were. You could have head to toe unbelievable gear. But yeah, the shoes, yeah. it's always going to be the shoes. Since there, Michael Jordan right. set that precedence mm-hmm. a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Yep. Because yep. young kids, that's the first thing they look at. They don't care what the uniform right. looks like because guess what? As long as I got on the uniform, I can kind of tweak it to look the way I right. want but my but my brand is my good shoe point very good point what yeah. I got on my shoe how my shoe was customized for me and my brand so the uniforms it, it is it, I like to tell people just being in the club I was in spring training for 18 days I got home on Friday the uniforms not as a big of an issue to the players as it is to Nike and oh. fanatics having an issue okay because pants and stuff have been made this stuff has been the material and all that stuff has been like they gotta go back and and look what was going on last year with the pants and bringing that to this like they're behind right now they're behind and getting the uniform the jerseys getting those letters back to the font back to the right size the only team that has their font Royals, correct right? right now i think is City yeah. Royals, yes, and they and the Yankees. I guess they saw a, they saw a snippet of it. Yeah, right, and the Yankees. They saw a snippet of it and was like, "We want the ones we had the year before. We want the okay. ones we had last year." So they were ahead of it, and nobody else got ahead of Interesting. that. Interesting. Interesting. It's a bit. It, it was. It was a fascinating c- couple of days, especially just looking at everything on Twitter and seeing the reaction. Oh yeah, to all of that. The good thing is I was there and had noticed it. Really. I was there and had noticed it. No, we had uniform day when I was there. Nike and Fanatic was there and all that stuff. And you know they hadn't. I think the 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 gray pants showed up a little late, uh-huh. but they got there before the game started. So I think that was a small issue. But other than that, like it's not that big of a deal in the clubhouse. And I think that's a testament to a good clubhouse mm-hmm. guy not making it a mm-hmm. big deal. And our guy Rob McCormick in Minnesota does a great job. Oh, hot ride! I love that. But, you know, the things that, that as a player, you go back into the clubhouse. I used to hate all the drama and the dramatics and the 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 complexities because I'm like, I'm just trying to be simple here, guys. I'm happy to put this uniform on every day. Uh, Tulo used to always la- make fun of me because he goes, Grill, you put your pants on to work. I said, I got four pairs. I can't wait. The favorite thing, the, my, my number one favorite thing, I want to ask you what your favorite thing. When I got to the field, putting on my uniform pants and my shower shoes and sitting in my locker for two seconds and be like, I got another day here. 
I love my job, <laughs> and I'm having this cup of coffee to just go. I'm not here to just have the cup of coffee. I'm going to put some cream and some sugar in it. Hey, hey, I got a cup of coffee in the big leagues. No, we got to spend a lot of time. And I go, too low. I said, I love putting on my pants every day. I don't take – I was trying to not take it for granted. I was grateful that, like you said, somebody always – whether I, my time ran out with one team, another one wanted me. I was always grateful that I had a uniform to put on and I could and I could jam with some of the guys that I got to play with. You know, to have all these I was fun grateful. stories. I was grateful for that. That's why I never took greenies, never did drugs. Mm-hmm. Not a, you know, I started drinking coffee after I was retired. <laughs> really? And I'll never forget Tom Kelly. Yeah, Tom Kelly would. He was like putting on that major, putting on a major league uniform every day. It's not adrenaline, adrenaline enough. Yes. Then you're in the wrong business. Mm-hmm. Yes. I missed you're in that. the wrong business. So how do you do? What's there's nothing. There's nothing, right? There's nothing for me. And I kind of had that feeling this weekend, even like. It's 70 degrees here in Pittsburgh. Very, very, uh, very interesting that we're having this weather in, in, <laughs> in the beginning of March. Indeed. You know, but I'm sitting there going, what? Cutting my grass doesn't get me excited. Like, like I said, what we were talking about. And, you know, we had to wait till late in the game, even like you get there at 12, one o'clock, and then you're not pitching sometimes till 10 30 at night, nine o'clock, nine o'clock. Yeah. And we're in a game. That's a long time to wait to all that excitement and adrenaline. <laughs> what do you feel is the thing that for you, you've tried to replicate it or things that get you out of bed in the morning? I, I try to talk about this transition because I think that's not talked about enough for players because, like I said, the game goes on without us. And that's fine. We got to borrow it. But it's hard even still because – you wish that someone would call you to, hey, I, I told the Pirates, I'll fill in for a broadcast. I'll go to Fantasy League camp. Remember me? I'm not, it's not about me. I just want to, I want to play. Yeah. I want to go like, hey, you guys are playing? Let me play too. I just want to <laughs> jam and joke around more so than the clubhouse because that's the stuff you miss the most, right? That's, that's just true. That is the stuff you miss the most. But, you know, <clears throat> just the game. The game is, it's um for me I just always tried to be part of it. Like when I decided I wasn't playing anymore, I was gonna shut it down, I'd already checked out like eighteen months before. So I spent the twenty fifteen season really locking in on what I wanted to do next. Hmm. Even though I had opportunities at and for the twenty sixteen season. I gave the jersey back because I never wanted them to take it. Yep. That's, I felt the same and, way, but I wish you stayed because I would have been a Blue Jay with you, man. We would have jammed. I know we would have hung out. For sure. <laughs> we would have hung out. And just playing for so long and having so many teammates and good friends retire before me or so many teammates who were forced to retire before I was, just listening to their conversation, um, understanding their struggles. So having a long career helped me because I got a chance to see how others who retired before me went about it, what they did that wasn't conducive to uh, transitioning to you know next phase of their life and what they did well in their transition. So I had a lot of people to learn from, which I think the ability to play as long as we did really helped me a lot because I knew if getting released probably would have did something to my psyche saying I'm not good enough. And that would have just triggered me to want to continue to play and retire on my own. I didn't want to do that. I'd never want to have that conversation with a general manager for him to say, Latroy, you know, you've had a great career and all, but we're going to designate you for assignment and you know, you're going to go through waivers and hopefully we can trade you. If not good luck. I never want to have that conversation. So for me being able to give the Jersey back like here, guys, I don't want to play anymore. Take your jersey back. I'm good. So when I watch the games now, when I call the games on the broadcast in Minnesota, I call it with the utmost respect for the guys that came long before me, for the guys that I played against, and for this generation right now. Nothing but respect and admiration. And sometimes I'm at the point now where I think about it was like, damn, were we really that good? Like We're good as these guys? I'm like, damn, I would 
I guess I was all right. Yeah, Grilly was pretty damn good. You know, wow. Do you question? Do you question? Like, ooh, I don't want to face this guy. I'm scared because <laughs> on the other side, I'm like, yeah, I can maybe run it up to in the low 80s, maybe on a good day. I don't know, but I don't know if I'm going to face some of these cats now, dude. There's the talent keeps going, and I feel like so far away from the game after I'm in my seventh yeah, retirement. I didn't try to. I didn't have anybody that I I didn't like facing because I came to grips very early on that fuck man this baseball I'm a pitcher they're gonna get me I'm gonna get them too so like that type of fear of failing or fear of somebody in the box I mean there was some guys I didn't like facing but you know I knew I had to and at the job that we did late in the game our managers pretty much set it up that way or their manager set it up that way because that guy is good off of me he's good off of you you know hey you know, that's that 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 chess and checkers. But I never I always had it in my mind, like, you know what? I can get you seven out of ten times, I'm gonna be all mm-hmm. right. Yeah. You go but I'm gonna get got three <laughs> times. I mean, that's fine. And maybe even twice. But I try to just have that positive mindset. It was like I don't I don't I'm not fearing this guy, but I understand the damage that he could do. But I do understand that. I got good stuff too, and I could be the chance of me being successful in my favor. Yeah, definitely in my favor. I'm enjoying that. the nachos rather than have to face Alcuna Junior or something. I'm just gonna say that. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, right. There's some guys similar to him, but not like you know, him, but similar. similar right? Jeez, I know, right? He's a these guys. Are, these yeah, guys are so talented, and you know, even guys that are coming up. It's now father sons like Roy Holiday's kid, or sorry, Matt Holiday. Matt Holiday's yeah. son. They're yeah. just, it's just the talent pool. <clears throat> I don't know. Like I said, the further I get away from it, I feel like the better. The talent pool is good. Yeah, it is. It's very, you know, we have some players oh, that we played against too, oh, are just, just as oh, good I, or, I, or better. So, well, but the older we get, it's like, wow, they're good. But we were good. No, too. I know we were good too. No, there's no doubt. I feel the same way. And I think that there are some concessions in the game that elevate maybe because if you're going to draw the story of, of baseball, we say, you know, how we love and respect the game. It's hard to compare generations to generations, given, like I said, let's just say a Vince Coleman or Ricky Henderson. With How many more bags would he have stolen with the bases the way they are now? <laughs> Come on, man. Like, like you know what I'm saying? Or With the two picks? Right? With the two picks? Right? Yeah. Do you think yeah. Nolan Ryan would have liked the 30-second clock? <laughs> would he have inspired 105 at the, at the clock to be like, don't tell me when I'm throwing a ball. I'm going to throw it when I'm ready. So these are things that I always laugh because, like I said, to your point, I know the good the guys that we had, they didn't let us uh, be without that rhino skin. They prepared us to say, hey, man, be a part of it. And some of the things I think that were permissible at the time with the rookie uh, clothing and some of the things <laughs> that, that, that there's no longer – I don't know if these guys, no, no, no. these guys would even appreciate it or enjoy why that was. And it wasn't to mock no. people. It was more over to be like, hey, you can handle that too, and it's all in good fun. We love you. And here's, Welcome to the fraternity. Welcome right. to this crazy fraternity that, what, 20-some-odd yeah. thousand people have ever done. It's uh, it's it's really, really cool. And, and LaTroy, you have been really gracious with your time here. Before we let you go, I wanted to do a quick little segment where I fire a couple of rapid fire questions at you. Just as someone who's been in the league as long as you have, um, these might be tough, but give the answers as, oh. as well, I mean, okay. they're, they're broad, but it's it, it, it's still fun. So oh, we're, the we're, first one, go ahead. What was you saying? No, I'm saying he, we, we, can, we, can, we can edit because you're a good editor. Oh, yeah. We can edit right. if, if we have to. <laughs> We ain't out to embarrass him, man. <laughs> um, first one I want to ask, favorite stadium to play in? Uh, favorite stadium to play in is probably whew, Baltimore. It's a popular um, one, yeah. Played in it when it was young. When it was, when it was, young, when it was young. When I was young <laughs> and it was fairly new. And I liked the warehouse out in right field. I thought that was cool. And the way it set, like right downtown, it was easy to get to. So I like Baltimore a lot. And then the older I got in the game, Target Field was a beautiful place. It was pretty sick. And old Mile High, I mean Mile High, no, Rock right. Coors Field. Yeah. I really like Coors Field. Coors Field's beautiful. 
beautiful. And I mean, Camden is just, it's, it's classic. It's base. That's baseball. That stadium. Um, next one here. And this could, I mean, Grilly talks about it all the time with his time with Pittsburgh and how much he loved, he loved his chef there. But what was the team that you played with that had the best food? The best food. I didn't forget now, but I know the best visiting food was t- uh, in Tampa. Ooh. Yes. Really, Guy Gallagher they had great food, yeah, man. They they always won best visiting clubhouse. The Cuban like, sandwiches yeah. there were insane. Oh, man, man. <laughs> they always won. And Guy is over. He Guy is in um, Anaheim now. Mm. Oh, yeah. he's in the Los Angeles. Yep, he's in Los with the Angels. Yeah, well, when I was in, when I was in Anaheim, the food was terrible. That was probably the worst. when I was in Anaheim. I was vegan at the oh. time, and um, can't think of our. Um, is that where you got? Our one oh, of our club is here. Vegan baseball also. card. It was from the vegan, huh? <laughs> yeah, vegan for all of 2013. Wow. wow, great experience. And our clubhouse guy was vegan, so we were take turn cooking, oh, bringing it in for each other. Big Ooh. leagues. Wow, with all the steaks. And stuff? Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It's called discipline, baby. Wow, called dude. discipline. See, this is stuff I didn't know about the guy that I know. You know, we didn't spend that. enough time on I the was, same team. I was losing so much weight. Oh, that's gonna be tough. <laughs> um, Jason Isrenhausen, my buddy, was uh, we were locker mates, and he, he came in one day. He was tapping on his head. He's like, "Hey, from big brother to little brother." He was like, "You might want to get another size uniform because that thing is swallowing oh. you." <laughs> <laughs> and Izzy was he was just blunt as the day was long. Man, he just didn't care. He's like. Your uniform swallowing you, bro. You probably need to eat a steak or See, something. That's I'm the beauty like, of nah, I'm in it for the long haul. I love that's it. The beauty of, that's what I talk about, what I miss in there, because you could say anything to anybody, even 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 what would be considered uh, discriminatory or racial, it was all out of love. Yeah. It was all out of love. We did, yeah. <laughs> we did see Of course. It. We say that now, like being in, like when I'm in spring training, just being in uh, Rodney's office, Hot Rod's office, and some of the stuff that we say to each other, you know, like good. We're great friends. Yeah. It's just He's funny, like you people. Street. Like, oh, you people, <laughs> you people. HR, HR, HR. You hear him? He said, "You people." Did you hear what he said? <laughs> I love that. I love that. Well, I got a couple more. <laughs> HR, HR, HR. <laughs> <laughs> kind of on the same trajectory, but you you talked about always loving to visit Tampa for the food. What was the best city in general to have an, uh, a road trip for? For me, growing up outside of Chicago and Gary, Indiana, man. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Chicago nice. for me. God, I love I love going to Chicago. That's awesome. Because I got to see my people. It's always great food. Mm-hmm. Um, you went more times than you went to anywhere else for us being in the Central because we played against the White Sox and the mm-hmm. Cubs. So it was just – I was a big fan of Chicago. Big, big, great place to visit. Michigan Avenue. It was always a family trip, so the go. family got a chance to come hang out in Chicago. It'd be it. tough to be vegan in Chicago, too. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> true. Right? This is true. Um, but I was in California when I was oh, vegan. It was easy. Oh, there you, uh, you picked the right place to be to be vegan. Um, the I know you mentioned that you, you didn't back down to any hitters, but who was, in your opinion, and maybe you could say maybe – not the hardest or the toughest, but maybe who was the most uncomfortable to face or who was the guy who gave you, gave you a little bit more trouble than others. Well, who Harold owned Baines, you? Man. Harold Bain? Harold. Well, all the guys that are going in the, in, it, in the, um, Hall of Fame. in the hall of fame, not this year, but the guys before like Mark, um, Edgar and all those guys, uh-huh. they all killed me, man. When I, I was so young, when they were in their prime, when I tell you, they took advantage of me. <laughs> oh, they just, it should have been, what they did to me was criminal. <laughs> it was criminal. <laughs> it was I criminal. love that. Oh. And, and and how about last question here? Um, and it was someone. There was someone you mentioned. I remember before we started recording, but you mentioned Tulo, and I don't know if that's the that's the answer. But who was the most? And it could be a pitcher. It doesn't have to be a hitter. But the most underrated player, either that you ever played against or that you played with, maybe someone who, you know, doesn't necessarily get the respect that you think they deserve. Ooh, underrated. I would have to say Tory Hunter. Mm, yeah, the man. I would have to say Tory. Um, when you look at his resume, man, he has one hell of a resume for serious Hall of Fame um, inclusion. Mm-hmm. Because 
what he was able to do defensively. Oh. You look at his numbers. He got better with time. Um, home runs. It was just, you know, what he was able to do. His leadership. Another one of those guys, like, did he have to lead by being vocal? No, of just watching the way he, he went about his business. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, Tory. He has a, there's a conversation to be had about Tory being – underappreciated especially by the people who votes for the hall of fame interesting that's really interesting it's been a it's been a, a popular topic too especially with the in the hall of fame yeah also we got one yeah, more. yeah also kenny lofton Ooh. yes kenny lofton 299 career hitter mm -hmm. i don't think people really understand like the team that, that he the teams that he played on his ability, his on base percentage, his ability to get on base for Baeger and Ramirez and Alex Burke yep. and, and Alan Trammell and all those guys that played there, it all started with Kenny. He was the he was the accelerant. Like he was the yeah. the the airplane fuel that you put on a flame because without him, it doesn't go. You know, without him, you know, being a defensive wizard out there, it doesn't go. Yeah. Like he was he was that team because the team went as he went. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, and I can say watching had, him, watching him, he was a little bit before my time and 2,500 hits. Going, yeah. I'd be like, I, I wouldn't even want to try to hold him on base. Yeah. You know, he was, that he fat. would get yeah. you thinking about him on base and you'd leave one fat. So to your point, mm -hmm. I agree with you big time right there. Yeah. I mean, you, yep. And he just got inducted. He just got inducted to the university of Arizona. Ooh. Ring of Honors in basketball. Wow. <laughs> Athlete. In basketball. Athlete. In basketball. Yeah. You're talking wow. about, I mean, that's so, a guy who almost, he, he had almost 70 career wins above, I think it was like 68 wins above replacement for his career as a center fielder. I mean, I, for a guy who, you know, didn't necessarily hit a ton of home runs, but hit 300 for his career, 299, it's 300. I mean, that's a, that's a Hall of Fame resume if I've ever seen one before, but uh yeah, he's he's that's a great that's a great on base percentage three seventy two. Yeah. I mean, three seventy two. The game, it's, the game that would be funny. We talked about a lot about stats, players, what those guys would be making. I remember when that Sports Illustrated, I think it was like nineteen eighty eight, when George Brett was making one point five, and they had all these guys mm. big league salaries when guys were just making a million dollars. And if you put like the game, uh, all these projections of who should be in the Hall of Fame. And what their salary should be, right? <laughs> if they played today, woo! Yeah, with their war, their war would be war. all these things oh, that yeah. were in existence, right? Kidding me? Yeah. Well, Latroy, I mean, we six hundred and twenty-two stolen bases, man. How much? Yeah. Like six hundred and twenty-two. Yeah. See, yeah. And if the bases were pizza boxes back then, you, you could put a, <laughs> might be able to put a one in front of that. You got a couple more. That's right. <laughs> Well, I, I want to before we before we let you go, tell us about your show and tell the people that listen here where where they can find that. Yeah, a lot of it. We, what we talked about today was about thick skin. So Jock Jones and myself wanted to start a podcast like this one and just you know talk about the game, give players an opportunity to you know when the media doesn't get it right. You know, a lot of times, say Grilly and I get in trouble. Like you know, everybody's going to just go and get get their information from somewhere else mm -hmm. and they never come to the source. Mm -hmm. Like they never get a player's the player never gets their perspective out mm -hmm. there. Never. Even when the media gets it wrong and it's time to apologize, still don't get the apology. So we just thought it'd be cool to start a podcast called thick skin. I like it. So thick underscore skin on Instagram. Uh, you can listen in wherever you get your podcast, Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your podcast at, we're there, but it was just something that we, we, we thought that we needed to do and, you know, give an athletes a voice, entertainers a voice, because guess what? When it don't go your way, the media will come at you. Oh, they come. Yeah. And then when they come, then you got X, Twitter, whatever you want to call it, Instagram. And you got all these people who don't have their houses clean, want to try to clean your house. It doesn't make sense to me. Well, let, so that's why we we did what we did. What we did. Thick Skin Podcast. Awesome. And if there's an awesome. opportunity to eavesdrop in on what Latroy Hawkins has to say, let me tell you, you don't just accidentally squeak out 21 big league seasons if you're not if if you're just a good guy. So look at that. That's right. Beautiful that's picture right. by Vernon Wells' dad. Right? He does that. 
Yes, that's my, awesome. That's that Vernon Wells Senior. Vernon Wells Senior. Uh, David Price got this for me my last year uh, with the Blue Jays. Nice. Uh, myself and Mark Burley, he got one for both. Oh, of that's pretty awesome. cool. Awesome. Two legends right there, Price as well. But uh, again, Latroy, thank you so much for taking the time. You could find our show just like that on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get those, and find the show on YouTube. But thank you so much for taking the time. We really appreciate you coming. Big on. time mound visit, bro. Thank you. Man. Thanks for thanks for inviting me to the mound visit. And I have plenty of those, but this one is the most special. <laughs> that's what we like to hear. Thanks, awesome. Bro.